Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have got a great show for you today. We are celebrating National Pollinator Week, and we have got some tips for all of our favorite pollinator plants, how to help out pollinators, and uh, you know other things that we can learn about pollinators today. And I am not doing this by myself, of course. I'm joined every single week by our co-host, uh, local food, small farms educator, Katie Parker. Hey, Katie. Hey, Chris, how are things going to come today? You know, um, uh, no complaints here other than the heat. I will say last night we were attacked by raccoons. The garden, I, I went out this morning, um, everything was torn up and destroyed. And you know what I did? I fertilized with a fish meal. Oh, um, and That's I kind of had, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I kind of had in the back of my head, like, maybe I shouldn't do this, but I'm like, I need to fertilize. Isn't that what they go after in potting soil too? Something like yes. that, fertilizer, fish meal. We had, um, so I have turmeric growing in a big fabric bag. Um, I also have some sweet potatoes growing in fabric bags. <laughs> They're all just ripped to shreds. Oh, no. Um, they pulled pepper plants out. They couldn't get one pepper plant out, so they <laughs> tore all the leaves of it out of the ground, uh, off the plant, because it's firmly rooted. Um, mm -hmm. I was looking for tomato plants everywhere because they just pulled them out, and I'm like, where are they? And I replanted stuff. Uh, sunflowers are trashed. Flats are trashed. We're having a plant sale this weekend. A bunch of those plants are trashed. Oh, so what I'm going to do is we're going to follow Peggy Doty's advice. This is a good time to test this, this advice because it's pretty anecdotal. Um, but we're going to test this out. We're going to put a radio out tonight and we're going to have it on talk radio all night long. I'm going to put a bucket over it. I'm going to see if we get the same kind of damage uh, for the next day. So we'll report back on that. Was it at your house or was it like at the um, office? It, it's at my house. Yeah. Oh, so man. Yeah. we were watering flats for, for some things for a plant sale with work and oh boy. But anyway, what a hey, someone who I know is probably also fighting off um, some of those urban varmints uh, is horticulture educator, Ken Jackson, Ken Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, I'm renaming you. <laughs> horticulture <laughs> educator ken johnson in jacksonville hey ken hello yes we've had some uh issues with the groundhog at our our lukeman garden site we planted a bunch of sunflowers and it's a good 85 to 90 percent of them are now gone we just have a small patch left so thought about replanting but probably not worth it mm -hmm. you know i have been hearing a lot like more and more problems with groundhogs. I don't know if their population is on the increase, but not only do I hear more problems about them, but I see them more frequently. So I, I just wonder, and we, you know, we'd have to invite a wildlife biologist on to probably tell us, but uh, if their populations are up or, or what's going on. Katie, are you seeing more groundhog issues? No, but it's interesting that, um, like, so we're having, our moles are becoming more of an issue um so i wonder if the warm weather are they searching more these animals are searching more for food or what's going on hmm. that, that's a great question yeah i possibly more food because we've had a very well it was an interesting spring i'll just say that much and so um plants are they're they're working to catch up and now they're kind of get set back a little bit with the this this heat and we've had some pretty dry weather ourselves here in macomb so uh, things have really slowed down in terms of plant growth here. So even though gardeners, we might be battling some mammal-like pests in our gardens, it seems like these days, uh, we do want to talk about today some of the ones that we want to attract to our gardens, uh, and that being pollinators. So this week is National Pollinator Week. When we post this episode, we'll be towards the tail end of it, but it's a good time to celebrate any time of the year when it comes to pollinators. Um, so to kick us off this week, I think it, it's important to know who we're dealing with here. So Ken, could you give us just a real quick overview of the different types of pollinators? Because we hear a lot about honeybees, but there's got to be more than just honeybees. Yes, there are definitely more than just honeybees. So obviously we have our bees. And like you mentioned, most people think of honeybees when they think of bees, but we have 
bumblebees. We've got carpenter bees, even though people don't like them a lot of times. They're still good pollinators. Um, there's small carpenter bees, which are really small. We've got longhorn bees, sweat bees, squash bees, which all kinds of different types of bees. There's like 500 species of bees, give or take, um, in Illinois. So there's a lot of diversity there. You know, we just kind of focus on honeybees, which aren't even native uh, to North America. Uh, flies will do a lot of pollination. Um, things like house flies, tachinid flies, some of those things we usually associate with dead animals and stuff. Um, we'll pollinate plants. A lot of times those flowers are mimicking carrion, dung, stuff like that um, to attract those flies. And sometimes they'll just land on flowers and, and feed on the nectar and pick up pollen and move it. Uh, things like surfid flies, which are going to be bee mimics. Sometimes people call them sweat bees. Uh, they, they're kind of visiting flowers that a lot of bees will. Um, they're also predators um, as larvae. So you're going to get a, a bonus out of that, both pollinator and beneficial uh, natural enemy that way. Uh, butterflies and moths will do some pollination for us. Um, I think a lot of times moths get overlooked because they're primarily out at night, um, but they will do a lot of pollination. Um, even though a lot of those caterpillars that we would consider pests for a lot of plants, um, those adults will still do some pollination. Uh, and then beetles uh, will do quite a bit too. Um, you know, there's there's hundreds of thousands of different types of beetles out there, so it's kind of hard to to generalize it. Um, but a lot of things like magnolia, some of our older lineages of plants are pollinated quite a bit by beetles. Beetles were some of the first, if not the first pollinators. Um, you know, in the fall on goldenrod, we see a lot of soldier beetles, uh, things like that. So there's a lot of beetles out there as well. Uh, wasps will also do some pollination. So wasps will feed their larvae insects and stuff. So their, their predatory is larva, but the adults are vegetarians. So they're feeding on nectar uh, and things like that. So they'll do um, pollination as well. And then in some things, we've got ants and in some plants, and they do a little bit, but those are kind of the primary insect pollinators. Birds and bats will also pollinate. Not terribly important um, in Illinois outside of hummingbirds. That's more of a more tropical or desert situations where we're getting into bats and birds. So, Ken, are all pollinators, all bees, uh, when it comes to bees or native bees? You mentioned carpenter bees, which are huge, like they're they're massive sized and, you know, relatively speaking, you know, maybe the size of a thumbnail or something. But but then this weekend, I had all of these little blue bees that were landing on my skin and I could watch their tongue. They were licking at my skin. What are they doing to me right there? So that's probably like a salt or sweat bee and they're getting the salt out of your mm -hmm. sweat. So usually if insects are, are landing on you. And they're not drinking your blood. Um, they may be trying to get the the salt and stuff out of your sweat, or maybe just the liquid too. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes sense. I was sweating a lot because it's been very hot <laughs> here, so <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Yes. Um, so okay, so we've had an overview here of the many different types of pollinators, and folks, there are so many different types of pollinators. Um, there's a diverse um, way for us to help uh, help these guys out, um, and then you know. What is the problem here with pollinators is that there is a, a significant decline kind of across the board when it comes to wildlife species. And we're lumping in insects here when we talk about wildlife. So um, there has to be help, ways for us to help uh, these pollinators. So Katie, could you kick us off? And we're going to do a list here of tips to help our pollinators. So Katie, could you uh, get us started here in our first tip to listeners to help pollinators? Yeah, so definitely one way um, that we can easily help our pollinators is by reducing our use of pesticides. Um, and so that can include um, insecticides as well as herbicides. We may not think herbicides are such an issue, but if you think about um, earlier in the season, if we um, spray herbicides in our lawns, we're killing dandelions as well as Chris's favorite um, violets. And so that's a, a food source for our pollinators. So if we are killing those that food source, um, we're taking that away from them and making their lives a, a little bit more difficult. Um, if you so desire to have a, a clear lawn, you don't like to have um, any dandelions or wild violets in your lawn, you could potentially um, like do some spot spraying if you must. And then you could, I would suggest having plants that are going to be blooming earlier in the season. 
So that way you're still able to provide a food source. Um, as for insecticides, obviously those are gonna kill insects. Different insecticides kill different insects. Um, and so we really wanna be cautious with that as well. Um, some things, if you do have problems in your in your gardens, especially your vegetable gardens, um, where it's insects are really taking over your plants, um, there is the option to make spray applications um, whenever our pollinators want to be active. So like later in the evening, um, that might be ideal to um, not be killing our pollinators. But ideally, we really want to just cut that use and not have to be reliant on it. Um, we can look at some of our IPM practices, so integrated pest management, maybe um, hand removal or digging weeds or things like that. So we don't have to rely on pesticides um, to control, like I said, weeds and insects in our lawns. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw in there too, um, just making sure utilizing those IPM practices, as Katie mentioned, and don't do the spray and pray technique or the, uh, this is the, I'm going to grab the bug killer, the first thing that something's wrong with my plant. Uh, that has happened a couple times with questions that have come in, at least to me, just this week, where folks have sent me in pictures of what looks like leaf scorch, which is more of an issue with drought because it's been so hot. And they said, I went ahead and sprayed this with seven. It was a rose. Went ahead and sprayed this with seven, uh, but I don't know what's causing this. First, we have to identify what's the cause. And when you think about per acre, when you compare the amount of pesticides applied in commercial ag versus just in a homeowner's yard, by the acre, homeowners apply much more pesticides to just a home lawn and garden area than a commercial ag producer will spray per acre in their field. So folks, we just have to make sure that it's it's pesticides are still an important tool, but it is not the only tool in our tool belt. So, all right, let me hop off that soapbox real quick and down. There we go. <laughs> and this, I'll bow. Let me bow. Let me bow. Oh, thank you. All right. But Ken, what is our next tip for helping out our pollinators? Uh, so be create nesting habitats. We talked about um, there's a lot of diversity with our native bees. Uh, so when we think of honeybees, they're they're nesting and usually in beehives, they nest in cavities and stuff. That's why we can keep them in hives. Um, but a lot of our, our native bee species are going to be ground nesting um, or nesting in like um, wood or pithy stems, things like that. So having habitat where they can build their nests, lay their eggs and rear their young. Uh, so when it comes to ground nesting bees, we want to have open areas of clear ground. Um, and I'm as guilty as anybody, you know, with horticulture, we want to mulch everything to keep those weeds down, retain that soil moisture. But if we have that nice layer of mulch over everything, we're eliminating some of that nesting habitat. So allowing some open areas in your landscape where you've got bare soil uh, so they can nest in there, even if it's just under plant canopy. Um, I had some in our strawberry patch last year, uh, fairly close to the plants, but it was still bare ground and they were nesting um, in there. Another thing is for those more of those um, tunnel nesters, so uh, pithy stems of flower stalks, so things like cone flower like that, if you leave those stalks behind, so we talk about garden cleanup, leaving 12 to 18 inches of those old flower stalks behind so they can utilize those um, to build their nests in there. And if you do that, you can go out and look at your plants and all the times you'll see a little kind of sawdust all over the leaves. It's because those bees have been going into those uh, stems excavating that and they'll lay their eggs in there and, and feed their young uh, in there. So making habitat for them, you know, making brush piles um, so they can overwinter. A lot of them will overwinter as adults, bees, some butterflies and moths will overwinter as adults, having areas where they can get out, kind of out of the way over winter um, and not cleaning up your garden, having that kind of spotless garden, so to speak. So I really do like that idea, and I am as guilty as you are, Ken, and I think many other gardeners of, boy, I sure do love to put mulch down. Um, it, it feels really good to mulch over an area. Um, I I really hope the mulch, at least for my personal gardening-ness, is a kind of a first step in establishing garden beds, and maybe over time, once we get that kind of that first flush Whenever we disturb something like we humans are so good at, um, we disturb something, you get that first flush of kind of annual, uh, kind of those first successional weeds in an area. Um, they can kind of take over and make gardening kind of a headache, but the mulch, 
at least for me, this is the, the long-term plan is maybe I can ease up on the mulch. I can incorporate more ground covering, maybe some more bare soil areas. And so, yeah, definitely um, that that is the long-term plan, but boy, I sure do. I sure do love the smell of mulch in the morning. <laughs> some people don't though. <laughs> I've got some mulch you can come help spread if you want. Hey, uh, that's a good invitation. I I will be there definitely. That's what is hundred degrees today? Is that right? So <laughs> perfect day <laughs> for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, another method for us, and kind of in keeping with creating habitat, is also protecting that habitat. So our third tip is is going out there and making sure that. We're helping to protect many of those areas to help our pollinators. Now, it sure is a really nice thing for us to create a pollinator garden in our backyard, but we also have to think about how are those insects going to be getting to that location. So if you are a oasis in the middle of a concrete desert, so to speak, how are they going to make it that way? Um, it could be very difficult. Doesn't mean that you're not going to get pollinators, but you might not get as many. And so helping to protect some of that habitat, maybe between your garden and maybe a more natural wild areas, um, and then also protecting those larger natural spaces where insects do have that opportunity to reproduce and live out an entire life cycle uh, in a natural area, maybe without having to encounter humans. And definitely one thing I see, especially more and more, is this idea of moths, as we had mentioned before, as being a pollinator and lights at nighttime. Um, moths expend a lot of energy going and flying around our street lights or our outdoor patio lights or wherever we have lights on throughout the night, uh, and that is exhausting to them, and so you know, it can contribute to uh, decline in their populations. And so um, having large swaths of habitat, maybe without human night lighting, can assist in minimizing stress to population. So protect that habitat, um, protect those natural areas. Uh, University of Illinois Extension, we have a, a, a whole volunteer arm called the Master Naturalists, and that's what their aim is, is conservation of natural areas and teaching others how to do that either in their backyard or in their community. So some additional things that we can do is um, we can also plant more flowers. So maybe that will be um, locations as well as the a variety of plants, as well as um, a blooming period for those plants. And so also something to consider too is, as Chris had mentioned, with our moths, they're flying at night. And so um, providing those moths with um, flowers that will be open at night and that they can um, feed on during those times. So uh, if we start off with um, a bloom period, we want to make sure that we have flowers in our lawns that are blooming from early spring to late fall. And so if you can plant different um, plants that are going to bloom across that period, um, that way we can provide season long feeding habitat for our pollinators. Um, some other things that you can think of when um, planting flowers is you can plant them in clumps rather than just single plants, um, as that gives them um, some more interest in your lawns as well. As Katie had mentioned, the idea of planting uh, flowers out there that have resources for pollinators at different times of the day, um, one of the things that we really need is we need more research about what plants produce that pollen and nectar resource and what time of day do they produce that. And so we do have a project, uh, an, uh, an association that's called I Pollinate. And so we'll leave a link below in the description uh, where you can check that out, where they're trialing different types of flowers out there, seeing what type of uh, pollinator visits they get to these flowers. And then one more thing, when we're doing flowers, <clears throat> I would think of one thing to look at is kind of the, that blossom shape and things like that. So a lot of times when we talk about pollinators, we talk about pollinator syndromes, and those are the different characteristics of of different flowers. So your color guide, your, your color, their nectar guides, what it smells like, how much nectar or pollen in the shape of the flower. And you can look at those different characteristics and you can kind of predict what type of insect may pollinate it. Those aren't necessarily set in stone, but it kind of gives you a general idea. Uh, so something like a, a bee, they tend to visit flowers that are they're going to be white or yellow uh, or ultraviolet in color. They can see into the UV spectrum, whereas they don't really see red all that well. Um, a lot of times nectar guides are going to be present, and those are just patterns on the, on the flowers themselves, on the petals, that kind of guide or display that, you know, there's nectar and pollen go this way. 
sometimes they're a lot of times they're UVs so we can't even see them. You know, so you can go online and and just do a search for nectar guys and you can find out all kinds of UV photography um, of them on there. Um, but then bees, those those flowers tend to have some nectar. They're going to have pollen because bees are going to be after that to feed on and to feed their young. And a lot of times those flowers are going to be shallow. They're going to have a landing platform and they're going to be tubular. Um, whereas beetles, they, a lot of times they're a lot more open flowers. So we think like a magnolia, large open flowers um, with leathery or thick um, petals on them because a lot of times they'll feed on those. Or beetles may like small clustered flowers. So there's all there's a, kind of a wide range of different flower shapes and sizes and and colors and that and the different insects are going to be attracted to different things. So having a diversity there will just make your landscape that much more attractive to different pollinators uh, and will draw more things in. And and Katie mentioned that season long bloom. So so again, kind of getting into those different flower shapes, we want to have multiple plants blooming at the same time, ideally. So usually you want two or three, if not more, um, not just that, that single flower blooming at one time. So I've, I've always told people, yeah, it's kind of like having a, a, a yard with a good big menu. Um, you know, when you go to the Cheesecake Factory, they give you like a book of stuff that they cook there. Uh, if we could provide a, just a book of different species of flowers, you're gonna have a diverse array of uh, pollinators, insects, and other wildlife utilizing your yard. We can say Cheesecake Factory, can't we? <laughs> We're not promoting <laughs> anything, right? I don't think so. It's okay. okay. <laughs> Maybe they'll become our sponsors now. Hey, there you go. Just get, <laughs> just give us a call. They'll start sponsoring um, pollinators. <laughs> yes. So Chris, since you're the landscape designer here, um, what are some things we should think about when we're creating a pollinator garden? Well, Ken, I, I feel like when it comes to design, this has become my new rule is that there are no rules. Um, maybe, maybe there's a couple, like don't plant invasive species, uh, you know, don't spray your neighbor's yard with herbicide. There's rules like that um, to follow. But when it comes to design uh, and starting a pollinator garden, a lot of times folks will start by asking like, how big? How big does it need to be? And again, not really a set rule or not really a set size. Um, anything you can do really is is contributing uh, to kind of that overall bigger picture. Um, so I would say there's not really a minimum size to a garden. Now, when I look at the Monarch Way Station project, which is a citizen science project for building pollinator habitat, kind of specifically for monarchs, but really it's to assist all pollinators so the Monarch Way Station project, they say about 100 square feet minimum, but even for them, that's not a hard and fast rule. They say, hey, if you just want to put some containers out with some pollinator plants, that's good enough. Um, and so, but they really say 100 square foot, that's kind of the minimum size and we can go up from there. Now, in terms of where should you be placing this pollinator habitat, um, as we've kind of been saying this over and over again, it, there's a diverse, there's a lots of different types of pollinators out there. Some of them are generalists that will utilize specific plants in the garden, but others are, um, you know, maybe they are specialists. And so there are specific plants that they're going to be utilizing. For the most part, in general, again, no hard rules here, we're going to be wanting a full sun exposure for this garden. That's going to give you kind of that, that biggest bang for your buck. You can grow lots of flowers in a full sun exposure area. If you have a shaded garden area, though, you can still plant woodland type plants. You can do spring ephemerals. You can do lots of different types of species out there. Uh, and we can leave lists of different garden sun exposures uh, down below for, for plants if you're looking for that. Now, some of the other things, though, that our, our insects need is kind of what we need. They need food and they need shelter and they need water. Uh, and so we can provide those things. So shelter is, as Ken has already mentioned, providing that habitat, pithy stems, um, providing water. Um, sometimes that can just be, it could be a bird bath with some pebbles in it. Um, you might have a natural source nearby, um, but water also helps. Um, also having a little bit of leaf litter or some type of organic debris on the, 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 uh, the floor of, of your garden. Uh, if that's what you're trying to attract. But also, again, uh, another thing is having a bare spot for them to have full exposure to that southerly sun. You can get some good bee nesting. Uh, sorry, you can get some good ground nesting bees uh, from that. 
And they're ground SCVs are a good thing. I don't want people to think like, oh, these, I don't want those yellow jackets in my yard because that's not what they are, right? Ken, what's the difference between a, a ground nesting bee and a yellow jacket? So yellow jackets are going to be a wasp and they're, they're social. So you're going to have multiple individuals in there and they're rather aggressive when you disturb their, mm -hmm. their, their homes. If you've never done that, take my word for it. Uh, whereas our ground nesting bees out, you know, bumblebees will nest in the ground. Um, but they're not quite as aggressive as yellow jackets and stuff. And most solid, most nest ground nesting bees are going to be solitary. So you've got one female doing it and they don't really defend their nests. So unless you step on them or pick them up, they're not going to bother you. I actually petted a bumblebee this weekend. It was foraging. And I thought I just took my finger and I just gave it a little pet, a little stroke, really did not care. So she was busy gathering pollen and nectar. Um, some of the other things though, to include in your pollinator garden. So we talked about nectar plants and we're actually gonna cover some of our favorite nectar plants, but that's important, pollen and nectar resources because they are pollinators. They are helping our plants procreate, you know, cause our plants can't get up and move and walk over and say, hey, I saw you standing at the other side of the garden here. I, you know, kind of like to take you out maybe for a drink or something over here at the uh, spigot. So um, they can't do that. So they need insects to help move that those the pollen back and forth. Um, and so we that's what they're there for. But the other thing that I also like to include in a pollinator garden are host plants. So when it comes to monarch way stations, we're looking primarily at milkweeds, uh, milkweed species. And so, you know, they they their recommendation. So if you're looking specifically at monarchs, is to have at least ten milkweed plants, um, maybe of like two to three different species uh, in, in your one garden. Um, be great to have more than 10, but 10 is really, they think, sufficient. Um, because if you do wind up attracting, say, monarch females to lay her eggs there, you're going to want to make sure that you have enough host plants, basically food, for her caterpillars to eat. Um, I've definitely seen that a number of times where the monarch caterpillars are going to strip the whole plant of leaves and then they're out of food so we have to go find some um, so host plants nectar plants and finally if you're putting in this garden you have to take care of it we have to manage i would say primarily weeds we talked about mulch earlier and how when we disturb things we get a lot of weeds mulching is an important part of this uh, component or making sure you're staying on top with uh, weeding the garden so for me i do utilize mulch to help keep weeds down at least with that first year or two. Uh, and once those plants become established, it's much easier to maintain them after that. In terms of plants, um, Ken, uh, we, we kind of talked a little bit before the show, uh, you, Katie, and me, about some of our favorite plants. So Ken, can you run down your list of favorite plants for pollinators? All right, I'm, I'm just going to do the ones that are blooming in my yard right now. This is like picking your favorite kids sometimes. Uh, so we've got Coneflower, we have purple coneflower blooming right now. Uh, we've got butterfly weed, butterfly milkweed. Oh, it's nice. That with the orange, the smaller one that's not nearly as aggressive as, say, like common milkweed and stays pretty small. Um, our rattlesnake master, which kind of looks like a yucca, um, is, is sending up its flower stalks. It's getting ready to bloom here, probably within a week or so. Um, I would think um, blanket flower <clears throat> is one that we've got. It's It reseeds in itself and um, it's it's been blooming for several weeks now. It's, it's always covered in in bees and and flies and and beetles and things like that. Uh, and then sunflowers. So in our yard we grow sunflowers every year. Uh, we've got some um, volunteers from our bird feeder um, that are starting to bloom now. So that's that's some of the stuff going on. We've got um, some gray headed coneflower that should be opening up soon. Obedient plant. Um, I could, I could keep going, but th those are just some of the, the things going on right now. I'm just, it. so in your list, um, you know, we'll, we'll list, you know, plants, but there are related species. So with coneflower, there's also the the pale purple coneflower, which is also blooming right now. I drove, I drive by a patch of it every day. It has the narrower petals. It's definitely more downward shaped, um, lighter color, purple. Um, that's beautiful. My my rose milkweed, or also known as swamp milkweed, is in bloom right now, too. And so it looks very pretty. Yeah. Katie, do you have some uh, favorite pollinator plants to share? 
Yeah, I definitely like Bee Balm. Um, it's a cool one. I like like the the seed head or the head of the plant on that one. And they're getting a lot of um, pretty colors with Bee Balm. There's pretty much all your like pinks, reds, purples. Um, I think they might even have a white, but there's all kinds of color options with that. Um, there are some issues with Bee Balm. Um, it can fall over easily. Um, but you can either stake it or I think there are some shorter varieties as well um, so if you have options with that. Um, and then it's kind of cool too. Uh, I like, I don't know, it's cool because it's in the mint family. It has that square stem and then it also puts off a little bit of an aroma. Um, and so I, I like that. Um, in my annual pots or like my pots that um, we have around like on our porches and our decks, I put a lot of lantana in that. Lantana is a fun one because it's very colorful um, and it kind of reminds me of like, I don't know, like Mexico or something. So I think that's kind of fun. Um, and so I use that a lot in our annual pots. Another one, a perennial um, beard's tongue is a cool one I like. Um, so it has kind of more of a, um, a longer flower on it. And it's cool with the colors as well. And so uh, they, I, I mean, a lot of what we have in our yard is purple, um, but you can, in the purples and pinks, and there's all kinds of shades now. Um, so there's all kinds of options. And um, those are some of my favorites, I would say. What about you, I Chris? See. Well, I, I, I have uh many fair i feel like if you would ask us next month our list will be different it's like ken said it's kind of whatever's in bloom right now or whatever new plant we've decided that we want to try this year mm -hmm. so it, it it definitely changes i also want to throw in there too um we're you're not a natives only uh type of uh podcast here uh natives definitely um have a, a strong foothold in assisting and being beneficial to our pollinators and we definitely want to promote those uh, but we also do as katie had mentioned we do have some of those annual plants that provide pollen and nectar resources for pollinators we have some non-native plants that do the same thing as well so uh i would say some of my favorites uh first one is going to be zinnia uh, or zinnia however you like to pronounce that one um, now, when it comes to this, there are double flowered varieties and there's the traditional single flowered. When we look at pollinators being able to access those resources, we really want to try to stick with some of those single flowers. We don't want big flower structures that might block them from getting to those pollen and nectar resources. And so, uh, but zinnia is one of those like super easy ones. We can throw some seed down or we can start them in some flats and it's really easy to grow. Uh, it puts on a fantastic flower show. I, I love them walking through the garden as we get later into the summer. We have all kinds of like painted ladies, uh, lots of different butterflies, uh, beetles, bees, all kinds of things are visiting them. And I can walk right through like a mass planting of zinnias and it just it's just covered in, you know, swarms of insects around me. And Another one that we always do grow is parsley, and this you could also grow dill, and this is mainly as a, uh, again, a host plant for the black swallowtail butterfly. Um, parsley, at least when I grow them in pots, it grows like crazy. So really, unless the plant is totally loaded in caterpillars, uh, they, they can't really slow it down. Another one is autumn joy sedum. It's a cultivar, but Boy, when it's in flower in the fall, it is loaded with flies. It's loaded with all kinds of insects, really, but I notice flies particularly. Um, and so that is one of my favorites. And finally, a new one that I grew this year, we ordered the um, the like Globemaster or the Hercules or the Gladiator giant allium bulbs last fall. And we planted them. This spring, those purple, giant globe purple flower heads were loaded with bumblebees primarily, and then other smaller pollinators uh, in addition to that. So that was a lot of fun seeing that actually provided a good pop of color and pollen and nectar resources. In a time in my garden, there's not much happening. So um, yeah, those are some of my my favorites. And again, that will change next week. So yeah. <laughs>
Um, folks, we do have a lot of resources for you. Um, so if you're interested in providing pollinator habitat in your home and garden, um, or maybe working with a neighborhood or community group in doing so, or again, consider thinking about uh, contact your local extension office for the Master Naturalist program. But we will leave links below to um, one of our major uh, pollinator efforts is Pollinator Pockets. Uh, it's based out of Champaign, but we're really pulling it statewide. Anyone can do something that is listed in the Pollinator Pockets brochure. Um, we also have the Pollinator Partnership. Uh, we have Xerxes Society. Uh, also, I will put links below for the Monarch Way Station Project. Indiana Illinois Sea Grant has a series of brochures to help in selecting and designing pollinator gardens. And uh, just to tease this a little bit, uh, we have been working on a pollinator website. Illinois Extension has been doing this. And so uh, it has been in the works for the last year or two. And uh, we are going to be scheduled to release this in August. And so I'm sure we'll have a big unveiling here on, on good growing uh, for the new pollinator website, uh, the University of Illinois Extension, the team has been working on. Well, that was a lot of information about pollinators, a lot of good information. So uh, hopefully, folks, you're taking notes and you made some plant lists to plant for this year or next year. Uh, check out those resources that we will list below in the video description or the show notes for the podcast listeners. Uh, the Good Growing Podcast is produced by Winnie Ferguson, edited this week by me, Chris Enra. Uh, special thanks to Katie and Ken for being our co-hosts with us every single week. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, thanks, Chris and Ken, and happy National Pollinator Week. Yes, thank you. Um, nice seeing you, Chris and Katie, and go walk through the flowers and enjoy the insects. Oh, I shall be walking through the flowers and enjoying the insects. Uh, so, folks, we're coming up on a, a fantastic summer holiday uh, weekend here. So uh, we'll have a Garden Fight episode for you next week, and then we'll probably be back at it with more good growing full episodes for you where we sit down with specialists and experts on topics, um, and we'll interview them and ask them questions. So, folks, if you have questions, feel free. Throw those in the, uh, you know, email us. Uh, let us know what answers you would like. Uh, or what topics you would like to hear. So listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing.